Maybe you're a horror fanatic. Maybe you grew up watching fairy tale theater. Hello, I'm Shelley Duvall. Welcome. Maybe you were scrolling Tumblr in 2011 and saw this picture and thought, now who is this? Everybody found Shelley Duvall in their own way. And once they did, I don't think it took long for most of us anyway to become totally captivated by her. In 1970, director Robert Altman had the same experience. Their chance encounter led to a creative partnership that would eventually yield seven films, with Duvall playing a major role in four of them. Altman, known as the 1970s most cantankerously critical observer of the current American scene, more independent and more consistently innovative than any other director at work within the commercial film industry, used Duvall in very specific ways as an actress, both reimagining what was possible for a lanky, untrained girl from Houston, and at the same time, creating a persona that potentially limited her growth. This is what I'd like to explore today. Robert Altman, Shelley Duvall, and the films they made together. I know there will be a lot of fans of The Shining who'd want to see a breakdown of that film, and I will talk about it briefly, but that story has been covered extensively elsewhere and tends to dominate Duval's narrative. So I'd like to spend some time focusing on lesser seen films that nevertheless contributed to the way she was viewed as an actress. With the help of Professor Justin Wyatt, author of the upcoming BFI Film Classics book about three women, I'll break down the magic Duval brought to the screen, how the pair worked together, and the roles she played in Altman's America. Before we get started, I want to give a huge thanks to Mubi for sponsoring this video. Mubi is a curated streaming service dedicated to elevating great cinema from around the globe. Get a whole month free at mubi.com slash Rewind. Let's begin at the beginning. Houston, 1970. Robert Altman, fresh off of the massive success of his Korean war comedy, M.A.S.H., arrives in the city to shoot Brewster McLeod. One night during pre-production, three members of the Altman team, who were looking for something to do, went to a local artist's exhibition party. There, they met the artist's girlfriend, showing the guests around, explaining the art. Her name was Shelley Duvall, and there was something about her. One of the gentlemen said, um, we have some patrons of the arts for friends, and would you please bring the paintings up Wednesday at one o'clock to our office? And I said, certainly. And I did. Wednesday at 1 o'clock, 35 <coughs> paintings, I'm there. And sure enough, there's some patron-looking gentlemen sitting around, mm -hmm. one of whom was Robert Altman. And instead of buying any of the paintings, after I showed them to them, they said, how would you like to be in a movie? Quote, unquote. And I said, uh oh, poor no, no thanks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm packing up. And they know, oh, wait a minute, it's MGM. It's Robert Altman. Have you seen MASH? And no. And here's 10 free tickets. And I guess after about a month of whining and dining and explaining, I said, oh, all right, if you think I can do it, I guess I can. Because I wasn't afraid of anything because I didn't know any better. And uh, that was how I got the part. And Bob sort of discovered me and he's responsible for me being an actress. Did Altman ever tell you why he thought you might be an actress on that very brief acquaintance? No, he didn't. It was a mystery to me. I wouldn't have understood it <laughs> even if he had. It wasn't necessarily unusual for Altman to have wanted to recruit an actor this way. He was part of a new class of Hollywood filmmakers interested not only in experimenting with filmmaking techniques like eight-track audio recording that allowed Altman to layer actors' dialogue, but also in subverting the norms of classical Hollywood. It's not so much that randomly plucking someone from out of obscurity was outside the norm of Hollywood casting. That did happen. Think. Lana Turner being discovered at a malt shop. It's who he found and how he wanted to feature them. I mean, Altman has said that, you know, 90% of the success of his movies are with casting. And if you get the casting wrong, it doesn't matter about anything else. So for him, it was all about casting. Um, and he certainly wants to portray the vividness of everyday life, of real life. So he's much less invested in working with movie stars and working with people, working with people who have perfect figures and, you know, perfect uh, faces. It's not about that for Altman. It's more about showing a range of people um, and how everyday people can look and how interesting the everyday is. By showing everyday people, uh, maybe slightly offbeat looking people, what he's doing is he's, he is going against classical Hollywood cinema, you know, and he's kind of embracing like, well, this is this period of the new Hollywood. This is a period where 
all the norms of the classical Hollywood cinema are gone now. And, you know, we have a chance to portray reality. Altman wanted unconventional actors to tell unconventional stories unconventionally. And you couldn't get more unconventional than Brewster McCloud. The film's hard to categorize. It's sort of a satirical comedy fantasy comment on the corruptive archetypes in American society. It's got everything, a professor slowly turning into a bird, a mysterious angel character who is righteously violent, plenty of poop jokes, Narcotics. and meta-Hollywood references like Margaret Hamilton, who played the Wicked Witch of the West, getting killed in these shoes. But mostly, the film is about Brewster McCloud, a young man who lives in the bowels of the Houston Astrodome and is building a pair of wings that will allow him to fly like a bird. Brewster isn't allowed to live at the Astrodome, though, and spends a fair bit of time dodging security and sneaking supplies in and out of his hideaway. He occasionally avoids detection by hopping into tours of the Astrodome, tours led by Suzanne, played by Shelley Duvall. Brewster does everything this way. He lives on the periphery, he takes what he must, he skirts the rules, he focuses on his ambitions. One day, during a downpour, he tries to steal Suzanne's car to run an errand, but she catches him and is surprisingly amenable to his plans. I don't mind you trying to steal my car. And besides, it was raining and everything. You don't want to catch a cold, do you? Rooster really has no idea what he's getting into when he meets Suzanne. She smiles constantly, is irrepressibly kind, and seemingly unaware of what is or is not socially appropriate. At first, this quality is played for laughs. I have to go to the bathroom. Oh, diarrhea. That's tough. But gradually, her naivete is revealed as somewhat reckless. She stole that car from a man who attacked her. She tears up a parking ticket because it's a waste of paper. She gears up for her car chase to avoid the cops. Although her actions suggest a personality that is willfully defiant of authority, someone who might giddily skirt the law out of some innate desire to rebel, Duval doesn't play her that way at all. She carries herself with an airy, daydreamy quality. Her Suzanne doesn't scheme, she floats through her own life, following her whims without considering what society might expect from her in any given situation. Brewster quickly falls under her spell. After all, doesn't she embody the freedom he's been seeking all along with his wings? Although he'd been warned by the mysterious angel to avoid sex and keep focusing on his goal, he sleeps with Suzanne and even confesses a secret to her. The strange deaths that have been happening around town? He's responsible. His confession spooks Suzanne and she turns him into the police. He hurriedly puts on his wings to escape capture, but in her betrayal, leads to his literal downfall. Suzanne is functionally a femme fatale, but this being a Robert Altman film, this femme fatale is no Faye Dunaway or Rita Hayworth. She doesn't smolder to seduce, she smiles. She has no ulterior motives, she simply reacts to what's in front of her. She isn't clothed in high fashion, but in cartoonish, colorful outfits with giant showy eyelashes. This embodies everything Altman liked to do with casting, subvert expectations and utilize the actor's actual personality to bring texture to the role. His screenplays were often purposely sparse with the expectation that the actor would improvise dialogue and movement to build the character. As opposed to, to theater where you have a, a play and you say, okay, let's get the actor that can, that can perform this character the best. We leave a bigger hole and we're saying, come in and play this character, but bring in the total behavior pattern with it. And, and those people get very close to themselves. And a lot of actors uh, don't like to do that. Mm -hmm. And you have to find the ones that do or are, are willing to. Bob works with his actors as friends. Uh, before he starts shooting a film, he gets to know you so well that he knows your little idiosyncrasies and your the little nuances about you. You know that he knows your limitations. By the time he starts shooting with you, you you have a great trust. He talks to you, and you feel like you're really creating your own role. He's not a director that tells you 
no, do it this way because he hired you in the first place because you were perfect for the part. It didn't matter that Shelley Duvall had never taken an acting class in her life or that she'd never even seen a play at that point. Altman wanted his femme fatale to behave the way Duvall behaved, to look the way Duvall looked. She explained, all I had to do was talk to get the part. Honest, I just carried on a plain old conversation, not about movies or anything. Beyond Duvall's ethereal quality, Altman was also very interested in her appearance. They seem to think there's something special about me, about the way I look. Not all that great beauty business, but something a little bit different, she told the LA Times. In the movie, they just let me keep on my false eyelashes. I wore mostly my own clothes. As we'll see later in the video, Duvall's appearance becomes a factor in nearly every single thing Altman uses her for, in varying ways and degrees of acceptability. Brewster McLeod got mixed reviews at best. It certainly wasn't the follow-up to MASH critics were expecting. Vincent Camby of the New York Times called it dim, pretentious, and even more than a little cruel. While the Vancouver Sun more generously said, the average moviegoer probably will be content to extract what fun and entertainment he can without worrying too much what's behind the story. And for what it's worth, that's how I feel about it. I think it's quite funny, bold, and has some interesting, if not entirely coherent, ideas. And Duvall has some of the funniest lines. Where's the bathroom? Well, they're bathrooms every 50 feet, but they're not really bathrooms, you know. They're, they don't have a tub or anything like that. Her notices were generally positive. She was alluring as the Eve who finally brings Brewster down from the clouds. The most effective satire came in the fetching person of starry-eyed Shelley Duvall as Suzanne. As article after article introduced Altman's latest discovery to America, journalists set a precedent for coverage of Duvall that would endure until the end of her career, a fixation or fascination with her appearance, each one describing her unique aesthetic in flowery detail, with particular emphasis on her eyes and her thinness. She had raggedy Anne eyes so big, you're sure symbols are going to clash when her lids come together. Twiggy could be called trunky in comparison with Shelley's appearance that suggests a straw with some velvet wrapped around it. She is not beautiful, but exotic, interesting. It's obvious that Shelley Duvall does not wear a bra. She doesn't need one. Her measurements are 30 and 1 fourth. That's not exactly the picture of a sex image one would conjure up. In retrospect, it feels genuinely insane to me to read some of these descriptions because while it's true that Shelley Duvall did not look like the typical Hollywood star of 1970, she is so pretty and they're acting like she's this alien creature who must be tagged and examined. I don't even think everything these journalists wrote was necessarily meant to be insulting, but it does go to show that traditional notions of beauty and sexual viability were as strictly enforced as ever in the 1970s, regardless of the strides made in other areas. After Brewster McLeod, Duvall signed a three-year MGM contract to work with Altman and flew to Vancouver to play a small role in his next film, McCabe and Mrs. Miller. McCabe and Mrs. Miller tells the story of John McCabe, a gambler who arrives in the small frontier town of Presbyterian Church, Washington, and establishes a makeshift brothel for the male-dominated community. One day, Constance Miller arrives and offers to manage the business, elevating it to a classy establishment known across the region. Soon, representatives from a mining company in a nearby city arrive and offer to buy out McCabe's business. Not realizing he's actually being shaken down by a mob-like group, McCabe drives a hard bargain until it's too late. Given how much I just rambled about how Altman liked to cast his films with people who don't look like or aren't even movie stars, you're probably sitting there like, wait, isn't that Warren Beatty and Julie Christie? Yes, McCabe and Mrs. Miller was the first Altman film to explicitly call upon established movie stars, although he hadn't originally intended to cast them, but they were necessary to secure funding. The rest of the cast, though, is indeed filled out by Altman regulars like René Aubergenois, Keith Carradine, Burt Remsen, and of course, the newest member of the troupe, Shelley Duvall. Although smaller than her role in Brewster McLeod, her role in McCabe and Mrs. Miller 
further elaborated on the spaces in which Altman imagined Duval inhabiting. She plays Ida, a mail-order bride who arrives in town with Mrs. Miller and is forced to turn to sex work when her husband is accidentally murdered in a fight defending her honor. Hey, Al, look at this. Hey, hon, you work at Mrs. Miller's? That's my wife! Bitch! Although Ida isn't a femme fatale like Suzanne, this is the second film in a row where a man she sleeps with dies, and it won't be the last of her collaborations with Altman in which that is the case. McCabe and Mrs. Miller is by no means the whimsical jaunt Brewster McCloud is. The tone is much more serious. It's a revisionist Western. But Duval again, is placed at the intersection of naivete, sex, and violence. In Altman's America, innocence is always corrupted or brought back to reality, and Ida begins the film as innocent as they come. With almost no dialogue until halfway through the movie, she's a deer in headlights, simply following orders until the violence of men forces her hand, and she must use her body to survive. As sexualized as Duval is in Altman's work, and as often as she's surrounded by violence and meanness, Altman never characterizes her sexual encounters as violent or unwanted. She's never a victim of physical violence. Even in McCabe and Mrs. Miller, we see Ida just once after she becomes a sex worker. A client leaves the brothel after indulging himself in a week-long stay, and all the girls wish him goodbye. Ida appears with a wide smile to send him on his way. This is a far cry from when we last heard from Ida in the wake of her husband's death. She shyly disrobes in front of her new boss, Mrs. Miller, unsure of how she will adapt to her new life. What are you doing? That's nothing to hide. McCabe and Mrs. Miller also confirms that Altman likes to utilize Duval's appearance as a kind of visual gag. Take her arrival. The townspeople watch a wagon full of new residents pull into town when one of them says, hey, maybe that's Bart's mail-order bride. The camera cuts back and forth between Bart and Julie Christie as he eagerly runs toward her, thinking she must be his wife. Until... Ida, I think this is for you. His bride isn't Julie Christie. She is the previously obscured, less glamorous Shelley Duvall. Altman uses Duvall's body to subvert Bart's hope and excitement. Mrs. Miller, though broadly disinterested in serious romance, will of course become McCabe's lover. Movie star shall be with movie star, regular person with regular person. This isn't the only time he would do something like this. Skipping ahead to their fifth collaboration, 1975's Buffalo Bill and the Indians or Sitting Bull's History Lesson, gives us another example. Duval is in this film for probably two minutes, and her presence is basically just a joke based on her physicality. In that film, Duval plays the first lady, wife of Grover Cleveland. Cleveland is repeatedly referred to as a huge man throughout the film. He's a hell of a lot bigger than you are. God, he's the biggest man I've ever seen. So of course, he's paired with the actress, probably best known for being Reed Thin, conjuring a cartoonishly contrasting visual not unlike olive oil and Bluto a few years later. On the positive side, you could argue, he's trying to engage with the, the range of what beauty can be. But it's a slight kind of like meanness about it. So he's like, okay, well, this is not a conventional beauty. And guess what? I'm gonna play her as not a conventional beauty. And I, it, I would do that time and again. And so it becomes, she's defined by her physicality over and over and over again, you know? And so that becomes, I think, a burden and a limitation to her because one of the things I find just so extraordinary, having worked on so many, so many of these Altman Duval films, is just if you look at particularly Thieves Like Us and Three Women, they're extraordinarily well-crafted performances. They're very subtle, they have a great humanity, they have a great caring of the character, an incredible compassion she has for the, for the characters. And you see what she can do when she's given her free reign a little bit. And it's so much more than just the physical aspect. So I think like the Altman connection with Duval, it cuts both ways. 
It's great that he, that he's there for her, but in some ways it's limiting. I mean, if you didn't have these like us and three women in that gang of films, I'd be like, he really held her back. Thieves Like Us marked Altman and Duvall's third collaboration, giving her not only the most screen time, but also by far her most challenging role to date. This film is really overlooked in Duvall's filmography and is almost never mentioned in summaries of her best work, even though it probably is one of her best performances. And I have to imagine that's because it's underseen. It almost never streams. And believe me, it's not that easy to pirate. Thankfully, though, a new 4K version was literally just released, so hopefully that can change in the future. Three escaped convicts take refuge in a small Mississippi town where they plan to resume their careers as bank robbers. While hiding out, one of the convicts, Bowie, falls for Kichi, who lives at the house where they're staying. Kichi takes care of Bowie when he's involved in a car crash, and the two fall in love. But soon he's back with his group holding up banks. The robbers become more notorious and therefore more wanted by the police. As Bowie attempts to rescue one of his collaborators from jail, he's betrayed and gunned down in front of Kichi. Another death for another lover. The late 1960s and 70s saw a rash of films about the 1930s. And for whatever reason, a lot of them were about bank robbers, most famously Bonnie and Clyde and The Sting. And Thieves Like Us was seen as another entry in this subgenre. Altman, as he would in Brewster McCloud, McCabe and Mrs. Miller, Nashville, and many others, used his films to pierce the myths Americans made about themselves through the media. A topic Broey Deschanel expertly analyzes in a video she just released on her channel. So I definitely recommend you go check that out if you want to hear more about how he does that through his filmography. In Thieves Like Us specifically, he tackles American mythmaking through deglamorization. He depicted in sincere, meticulous detail the dying years of a depression-filled southern United States, where thieves are just like that, people who rob to live, not larger-than-life figures like Bonnie and Clyde or one-dimensional fiends such as the infamous Ma Parker. Altman's film wouldn't have the hottest people you've ever seen looking like they just stepped out of the California sun, executing badass heists against mustache-twirling villains. His criminals don't steal for the heck of it, they steal because they need money, because they recognize what separates the haves from the have-nots. They're not gunned down in a blaze of glory, their deaths are tragic and destructive. Hell, you don't even get to see a robbery take place in this film. It's all done off screen, left to the imagination, while Altman contends with the real, quiet moments between jobs. The cast was also seen as de-glamorizing the genre. Maurice Yakawar writes, Indeed, simply by casting Duval and the course featured Keith Carradine in roles usually played by the romantic likes of Farley Granger and Kathy O'Donnell in They Live By Night, or Warren Beatty and Faye Dunaway in Bonnie and Clyde, Altman restores a realistic, human dimension, warts and all, to the fictions of an impossible romantic myth. Comparing Faye Dunaway's Bonnie to Shelley Duvall's Kichi draws out that difference so clearly. Rather than authentically situate Bonnie in the 1930s, Dunaway's hair is teased, she wears false eyelashes, and sports a cat eye to echo the latest 1960s fashion. Kichi, on the other hand, wears no makeup. Her hair is stringy and hangs loose. Kichi isn't a young girl made to look like a full-grown woman the way Hollywood likes to do. She is meant to be and is played like an actual young girl. She doesn't quite know how to hold a cigarette. She and Bowie flirt awkwardly like two unsure teenagers. When she drinks a Coke, she takes generous, thirsty squigs. The bottle doesn't linger suggestively with the power of a movie star the way Dunaway drinks as Bonnie. In this context, Duval's thinness reads as youthful, almost childlike. But Kiji must mature quickly, as a caretaker, then a lover, whose innocence is again destroyed by the violent machinations of men. In the original novel the film is based on, Kichi dies with Bowie. But Altman didn't want Kichi to die. This spares us witnessing Duval enacting a gruesome death, 
but also leaves Kichi to contend with the consequences of the violence around her, a first for Duval's characters. Rather than ending the film on Bowie's death, Altman briefly shows us Kichi's life after Bowie. She's pregnant at a train station, willing to go anywhere new, and already telling stories to craft a new narrative herself. Is it dead? <laughs> Consumption. The reviews for Duval's performance were glowing. She had evolved from a fresh-faced newcomer to a full-blown lead with potential. The New Yorker Review in particular spent a lot of time praising her and really captured what I think is so compelling about Duval's screen presence. With Shelley Duval, you couldn't be conventional even if you wanted to. She looks like no one else, and she acts like no one else. Shelley Duval may not be an actress exactly, but she seems to be able to be herself on screen in a way that nobody ever has before. She doesn't appear to project, she's just there. Yet you feel as if you read her every thought. She convinces you that she has no veils and nothing hidden. Her charm appears to be totally without affectation. Altman must have sensed in that inexperienced 20-year-old girl some of the qualities that separate him from other directors. A gambler's euphoria about playing the game his own way, assurance without a trace of imitativeness. This role convinced Duval that she actually wanted to pursue acting. She told people, after Thieves Like Us, Robert Altman looked at me and said, I knew you were good, but I didn't know you were great. It's the reason I stuck with it and became an actress. Although Duval had proven that she could play a complex lead character, Altman's next film would once again place her in a kind of marginal role. Now, after years in the making, Robert Altman brings to the big screen along the way to Nashville with 24. Tell him 24 of your very favorite stars, David Arkin. Robert Altman described Nashville this way. It was about the incredible ambition of those guys getting off the bus with a guitar every day and, like in Hollywood, trying to make it. I just wanted to take the literature of country music, which is very, very simple, basic stuff, and put it into a panorama which reflected America and its politics. The film follows various characters who all converge on the country music capital of the world, Nashville, Tennessee. Most of the characters don't know each other, but their lives intersect regardless, and the audience follows them over a five-day period, ending with a benefit concert for an independent presidential candidate. We learn their wants, desires, and fears along the way. We follow musicians, both famous and aspiring, a journalist, political advisors, locals, and Martha, or L.A. Joan, played by Shelley Duvall. Her aunt is dying in the hospital, and despite her uncle's best efforts to get her to visit, the glitz and glamour of the country music scene constantly distract her from his every attempt. Really Esther's hot. awake and she's dying to see you. I'll be there in a minute, okay? I'm talking to someone right now. She couldn't care less about her dying aunt if there's a singer or an attractive soldier walking by. She wears eye-catching outfits, flirts with anyone she thinks might have some stature, and leaves the minute someone new comes along. No one she sleeps with dies, but spoiler alert, someone does die. And once again, we see Shelley put at this cross-section of sex and violence, using her body until she is inadvertently placed in harm's way. Not only does she attempt to seduce the eventual shooter, but unbeknownst to her, she also picks up his gun hidden in his violin case. In Nashville, however, Altman complicates that Duval naivete. Naivete, after all, can suggest innocence or inexperience, but it can also mean ignorance, the difference between unthinking and uncaring. L.A. Joan acts on whims like Suzanne, yet her actions don't fly in the face of overbearing authority figures, but in the face of her loving, grieving uncle. Her selfishness is deeply cynical, but I think Altman mostly gets away with it because it's all played for laughs and, well, no one in Nashville has spared his judgment, fairly or unfairly. In a 1978 interview, Nashville screenwriter Joan Tewksbury explained that she originally wrote the character Albuquerque, who's played by Barbara Harris in the film, for Shelley Duvall. Albuquerque was supposed to be more of a Suzanne-like girl who came into town to cut a demo record had no money, and yet made her dreams happen anyway. Shelley is a study in survival, Tewksbury said. She's like a cat that always lands on its feet. So that's why, for example, 
Albuquerque ends up on stage performing at the end of the film, realizing her ambition of singing, albeit in chaotic circumstances. I used Shelley Duvall. Shelley will never be down in a crowd because she's got that sense of curiosity about her and it will take her to the right place. If there's something to see, Shelley's going to see it. So I just treated Albuquerque that way. L.A. Joan, on the other hand, was based on a little girl I know in Los Angeles who was one of the most gorgeous voices I've ever heard. Originally, L.A. Joan was the only pure voice in the movie. You kept hearing her sing. As with most Altman movies, things shifted around quite a bit from script to screen. And when he cast Duvall as L.A. Joan, the character had to reset and adjust to Duvall's skill set. Tewksbury said, well, Shelley doesn't sing that well. And she said, what'll I do? And I said, there's one thing that you do really well, and that's put clothes together. So man, she went out and put that whole wardrobe together. Duvall later added, in Nashville, absolutely nothing was written in the script about my part as the groupie. So I went out and bought all those crazy clothes. I had to make her visual. You see, there's always a way. The wardrobe is L.A. Joan in many ways because the role requires very little character work otherwise. She doesn't evolve at all throughout the film. In that sense, it makes Duval's costuming all the more impressive because I'm willing to bet that if you remember anything about Shelley Duval in Nashville, you remember what she's wearing. Duval made a character out of nothing, a shapeshifter of supreme confidence and ambition. At the same time, once again, Altman seems content to let Duval's aesthetics do most of the talking here. He could have given Shelley more to do, but instead showcases her figure like an exotic bird. On the one hand, great, because she looks cool as hell. On the other hand, he continues to place Duval in a box, limiting her to a visual gag, even after she had demonstrated her talents in Thieves Like Us. I read an interview with Altman where he talks about Duval as L.A. Joan, and he goes, well, you know, she was a cartoon in that movie. And I'm like, okay, well, that's interesting. It goes along with what you're saying about one dimension. So Altman sees her just as the physical, you know, in that film. Like, that's that that's exactly what he wanted, how she looks. Nothing else mattered to him. After Nashville came that brief appearance in Buffalo Bill. Then something happened that would lead to the most successful collaboration the two would have together. Robert Altman woke up from a dream with an idea for a film in his head. Three Women centers on Millie Lamoureux and Pinky Rose. It's Pinky's first day at a health spa for the elderly in the desert, and she immediately latches onto Millie, a coworker who trains her for her new position. Millie is a yapper. She talks constantly about new recipes, magazines she's reading, about men she's interested in, and truly no one is interested. Her female colleagues ignore her, her male colleagues slouch over and disengage. Her neighbors at her apartment building scoff when she walks by. But Millie doesn't notice, or more likely she does notice and forges ahead anyway, defiantly crafting a personality she thinks will win her popularity based on what she's gleaned from magazines. Pinky adores Millie regardless, and slowly ingratiates herself in Millie's life. Eventually she becomes Millie's roommate and visits the bar Millie frequents. There she meets Willie, a quiet woman who works on mysterious reptilian murals, while her husband Edgar runs off with his buddies to dirt bike, shoot guns, drink, and flirt, sometimes with Millie. Tensions flare as Pinky becomes more comfortable in Millie's space. One night, Millie brings Edgar home, and Pinky, angry on behalf of Willie, begs Millie not to sleep with Edgar. Millie refuses and tells Pinky that she should just move out if she doesn't approve of her choices. Pinky is distraught and attempts suicide. She survives, but the movie from here on out isn't so straightforward. Pinky slowly takes on Millie's personality, becoming more outgoing and even more aggressive. Millie is taken aback, scrambling to retrieve her life from this stranger. The film becomes even more dreamlike and vague, eventually tipping into horror in a shocking scene in which Millie is forced to help Willie deliver her baby at home. A lot has been written about what three women could mean or what it's trying to say. I personally wouldn't want to commit to any single theory. It's going to be different for everyone, and I don't think there's an actual correct answer. 
Altman once explained, I'm trying to reach toward a picture that's totally emotional, not narrative or intellectual, where an audience walks out and they can't say anything about it except what they feel. And honestly, that seems to be how critics reacted when they first saw it. I've never seen critics so openly stumped by a film, but in a way that still showed their openness to it and appreciation of what it was trying to do. For example, get a group together and go en masse. Afterward, you can argue about the psychological implications. Majority may rule, but I doubt a unanimous conclusion will be forthcoming. I can't knock a picture that unstrings a nerve in my own psyche, even if I walk out in mental disarray. Regardless of what it could mean, one thing is for certain. Shelley Duvall gives the performance of a lifetime as Millie Lamoureux. Duvall tends to underplay most of her roles. She doesn't make a lot of big choices. Usually she doesn't need to. But what makes Millie so extraordinary is how many subtleties she can cram into that range. The slight, big sisterly roll of her eyes when Pinky misbehaves. Her resignation that she must give her bedroom over to Pinky. The fear settling in as Pinky consumes her identity. Of course, Duvall can go big. And because she spends so much time in a very subtle register, when she finally does, the effect is all the more powerful. She explodes and trembles with such ferocity, a preview of what she would achieve in The Shining. All of these notes are necessary because Millie is a mass of contradictions. She appears so finely curated, so idiosyncratic. But the more you listen to her speak, the more you realize how cliches and magazines have shaped her personality. She's social and outgoing, but seemingly unable to form a genuine connection with anyone. She's so gentle with the guests at the spa, attentive to Pinky in the hospital, but also insensitive enough to sleep with a married man, vain enough to think about her hair while being hugged. As Roger Greenspun put it in film comment, Millie descends from a long line of Robert Altman's satirical portraits, in which the satire is typically relieved by an understanding so rich and so benevolent as virtually to reshape our awareness of the world it helps us see. There is no condescension in this portraiture, and nothing shields Millie from appearing both as ridiculous and as fine as she is. This is due in large part to Duvall's participation in crafting the role, which extended far beyond her work as an actress. There was virtually no script for the film, so she was tasked with writing her own dialogue. It's estimated that she personally came up with about 80% of it. Yes, I did. I did a lot of writing myself. Um, Bob allows you that freedom. And like, for instance, one day at lunch, he said, OK, Duvall, you can't have lunch today. And I said, ah. Oh. And he said, uh, you have to write the scene for, for this afternoon. So I went and I got my lunch, and I sat in a room by myself, and I wrote the scene. She also costumed Millie and decorated Millie's apartment, shaping that gaudy yellow motif that defines her. In other words, the Millie we see was not simply born from the mind of Robert Altman, but sculpted very much in collaboration with Duvall to an even greater extent than her previous characters. The scale of her involvement, to me, certainly calls into question the way we attribute works to so-called auteurs of cinema. The, the question of Altman and his female collaborators is really an interesting one too, because I, th I think that he doesn't give enough credit. I know he doesn't give enough credit to his female collaborators especially. And I'm talking about Joan Tewksbury, I'm talking about Duvall as an actress, but even someone like Patricia Resnick. I mean, Patricia Resnick's a great writer, and she did nine to five for heaven's sakes. You know, with three women, I interviewed her and she told me, yeah, uh, he, he had this idea and then I fleshed it out and I had to do a treatment and I would be on the upstairs office and he'd be at the downstairs office and I'd keep writing and doing different things. And then, you know, he's like, well, you'll do the screenplay, you'll do the screenplay. And then eventually he was like, no, we're not going to do a screenplay. We're going to you know, do it on site. We'll, we'll kind of uh, improvise and we'll, we'll develop it on site. So suddenly you have somebody who was really just out of film school, who had no ability to fight back against Robert Altman. And I said, well, did you feel like suing him? You know, they, they, she was, if I sued him or did anything like that, she, she would never work again, you know? Um, but she, but it, it really kind of broke my heart to hear that, that anecdote because I was like, wow, Patricia Resnick 
was really misled by Robert Altman. I mean, this it goes beyond bad information. I mean, promises that were made uh, to a creative individual were just broken. Yeah, or just even the the very neat and tidy credit uh, in Three Women, where it's like produced, written by, directed, is feels very generous. <laughs> I know it's like okay, I did everything. You know, I even catered the the, 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 sh the movie. It's like crazy. I mean, it's like the auteurism stuff is is it's so male defined in the seventies. Well, generally, it's male defined anyway. But it's really male defined in the seventies, and people don't talk about that enough. Not all critics were sold on Three Women, but many loved Duval's performance. The New York Times called Millie one of the most memorable characterizations Mr. Altman has ever given us. Andrew Saris mused in the Village Voice that there was something magical about Shelley Duvall's performance. If I want to convey what Three Women really is, as opposed to what it merely means, I could do worse than try to evoke Shelley Duvall's stride as she walks from one social calvary to another. There is so much spiritual grace in that stride, and so much wisdom in Altman's decision to follow that stride to the ends of his scenario, that one is ennobled simply by witnessing the bonds of compassion between the director and his actress. Nothing else in Three Women is quite so overwhelming as the cumulative gallantry under stress of Shelley Duvall's Millie. Duvall won Best Actress at the Cannes Film Festival, as well as the Los Angeles Film Critics Association Best Actress Award. Come Oscar season, a lot of pundits thought she had a chance at a nomination. However, they also acknowledged that 1977 happened to be one of the most competitive years in the Best Actress category since 1950. The 1970s had seen a dip in substantial roles for women. Some years they even struggled to fill the Best Actress category. And yet, suddenly, in 1977, you had Diane Keaton in Annie Hall, Shirley MacLaine and Anne Bancroft in The Turning Point, Liza Minnelli in New York, New York, Jane Fonda and Vanessa Redgrave in Julia, Lily Tomlin in The Late Show, and of course, Duvall and Sissy Spacek in Three Women. It was a crowded, crowded field, and though many predicted Duvall would secure a spot for herself, she didn't. Instead, Marsha Mason, somewhat surprisingly, nabbed a nomination for The Big Goodbye. <laughs> I don't think it's reaching to assume that Academy voters found The Big Goodbye easier to consume than Three Women, which critics liked but didn't receive a single Oscar nomination. But there's also something about who the Academy believed Duvall to be and the limits they imagined for her based on what they had seen in her Altman films. Andrew Saris, for example, admitted that when he first heard Duvall and Spacek would star together in Three Women, that he found them too quirky to represent a reasonable range of womankind. I think one of the tragedies of her career is the fact that for whatever reason, you know, Lionsgate or Twice Century Fox never got behind her enough trying to get her an Academy Award nomination for Three Women. Because it was such an extraordinary performance, but she needed to be bumped over in terms of like, okay, she needs to get over the bar to become a star. And I think if she had a little more attention for that role, I mean, obviously she won a con, so, oh, she shared the award at con, so that's a big thing. But I think that, that for, in some ways, the reception of her performance in Three Women is kind of filtered through the limitations that we've talked about already for her in, her in those other roles. You know, like, oh, she can do this? Well, maybe she's better than we thought, you know? Duval always spoke highly of Robert Altman. He offers me damn good roles, she told the New York Times. None of them have been alike. He has great confidence in me and a trust and respect for me. And he doesn't put any restrictions on me or intimidate me, and I love him. But at the same time, around three women, Duval begins to hint in interviews that her ambitions as an actress were sometimes greater than the opportunities Altman was willing to give. In 1978, it was revealed that she had turned down a role in his film, A Wedding. She attributed her decision partially to her desire to spend the summer with her boyfriend, Paul Simon, but she also suggested in interviews that she didn't want to backpedal to bit parts like she had after Thieves Like Us. Maybe I'd gotten spoiled, but it would have seemed difficult to go from playing one of the leads in Three Women 
to what would have been a very minor part in a wedding, she said. I had to stretch my legs, I really did, because I was beginning to feel that no one had any confidence in me as an actress other than Robert Altman. I was beginning to wonder if I could function without him. One can't really blame her for feeling that way because although she'd been working and had been well-reviewed, she wasn't really booking a ton of other projects. Besides her films with Robert Altman, she'd made a few minor appearances on television, appeared in a short directed by Joan McLean Silver, which is great by the way, and on YouTube, and had a small role in Woody Allen's Annie Hall. Allen, by the way, used Duval much in the same way that Altman did. She plays a Rolling Stone reporter who won't stop talking about the celebrities she's seen perform live. She's the other girl he can date, who clearly isn't the obvious catch that Diane Keaton is, but who he sleeps with anyway. So why, after Thieves Like Us, did no other director snap her up and try to do something with her? She was constantly working for Altman, but for much of the 70s also seemed to be running in place, becoming the quirky girl through these small parts and the way that Altman used her. She knew this and told Roger Ebert in an interview, well, of course, Robert Altman was almost the only director I'd ever worked with. It was time for me to test my own legs. There was a kind of possessiveness about Bob. He put me in so many of his films, but apart from him, I wasn't getting offered a lot of roles. Hardly any for that matter. It was like he was the only one with any confidence in me. The, the Duval not having opportunities after Thieves is a story that I, I think we could make for any number of actresses. I mean, I think that in the period of the new Hollywood, you have these actresses who are, are maybe not as, quote, offbeat looking as Shelley Duvall, but they're certainly not conventional Hollywood beauties. I'm thinking like Talia Shire, uh, Candy Clark, Stalker Channing, you know, people like that. Karen Black is a, a really good example. Carrie Snodgrass. Um, and, you know, people like, oh, that has incredible opportunities for actresses. When you look at career like Karen Black, Karen Black's an extraordinary actress. I mean, just amazing. And yet, you know, after Day of the Locust in 1975, she didn't have a lot to do. And then she started doing horror films in the 80s. And then it was kind of like, whatever happened to her. So I think that the, the story of Shelley Duvall not having the opportunities after Thieves is also a story of a, a, large, a large number of female actors in the mid 70s that distinguished themselves with performances and yet had nowhere to go. Of course, Shelley Duvall did get noticed by one director, Stanley Kubrick. As the story goes, he noticed her in Three Women, although in reality, according to Wyatt, he'd actually noticed her years earlier in Thieves Like Us. She accepted a role in The Shining, which kept her occupied for a full year. Occupied and crying. Altman's initial acting advice to Shelley Duvall was to never take herself too seriously. Relax. He trusted her to figure out her own character and bring herself to the table. Stanley Kubrick was the opposite. And though the psychological damage Duval experienced while shooting The Shining has been greatly exaggerated, there's no question that the shoot was punishing and grueling, as it probably would be for anyone, but for Shelley Duval specifically, whose primary acting work had been done for a director who encouraged improvisation and self-expression. Her next film would give her a change of pace she needed after that horror, although it wouldn't be an easy shoot either. As unintuitive as it might sound, given everything I've said about Robert Altman up until this point, he agreed to direct a film adaptation of Popeye the Sailor cartoons for Paramount. Paramount wanted Lily Tomlin to play Popeye's love interest, Olive Oil, but Altman insisted that only one person could play her, and that was Shelley Duvall. Shelley Duvall, to me, was Olive Oil, and he didn't want to use Shelley Duvall. And I, I just, at that moment, I said, this is who I'm using in the film, or, or I'm not doing the film. Of course, she was the best thing in the film. She was perfect. She had all the naivete that made that character other than just an imitation. He called me up when I was doing The Shining and said, hi, Shelley, he said, I've got the role you were born to play. He says, guess what it is? I thought for my, I thought, oh my God, I don't know. I said, come on and tell me. And he said, olive oil, of course, who else? You know, who else is as awkward as you? Apparently Altman wasn't the first person who thought this. I guess every tall skinny girl gets called olive oil at least once, 
But I was called olive oil a lot as a child, she said in an interview. And like olive oil, I've been described as awkward and I've also been called ungainly. Well, that's life. In the film, Popeye arrives in Sweet Haven looking for his long lost father. He rents a room at the oil residence where Olive is preparing for her engagement to Captain Bluto, a large gruff man with no other redeeming qualities. Olive runs out on Bluto and slowly she and Popeye fall for each other and become linked when they find a random baby and decide to adopt it. Popeye feuds with some townsfolk, especially Bluto, while gaining the trust of others as he continues to search for his father. I know a lot of people watched this film when they were kids. I didn't, so I didn't have any baked in affection for it when I saw it for the first time while researching this video. And I didn't have much affection for it after I saw it either. The plot is meandering. Popeye doesn't so much search for his father as accidentally run into him. They had to re-record a lot of Robin Williams dialogue and you can tell most of it is still inaudible. The songs with the exception of He Needs Me aren't great. And although on paper it's a comedy, well, I, I agree with the New Yorker's review. You can see the intelligence and skill that went into the gags, yet you don't hear yourself laughing. It's just not a very well-executed film. There are, however, two significant redeeming factors. First, my God, it's nice to see an IP film with real sets, bright colors, and practical effects. I mean, the way they built an entire village and functioning boats for a movie is absolutely inconceivable in today's entertainment landscape. They still exist, by the way. You can go visit the set in Malta. And what's even more amazing is that all of this was done with a budget of $20 million, which even accounting for inflation is not that much compared to what IP films cost today. This isn't to say everything looks great or that they pull off all of the practical effects. But look at that cherry red. Look at that aqua blue. The second redeeming factor is Shelley Duvall's performance as Olive Oil, indisputably the best part of the film. As different as Olive Oil might seem from her other Altman characters, Duvall approached the character in terms we will find familiar. I based Olive on Mae West, she said. I tried to make her a femme fatale, a seductress, a liberated woman but every time she thinks she's got it made, she trips over her own feet. After all, Olive was the subject of the hero and the villain's romantic interest. In Sweet Haven, where odd shapes and offbeat fashions are the way of the world, Shelley Duvall sets the beauty standard. She becomes the romantic lead, allowed to exist without a winking sense of irony. No role would utilize Duvall's body to greater effect than olive oil. If Altman had purposely emphasized cartoonish aesthetics with L.A. Joan and Suzanne, and a cartoonish sense of humor in Buffalo Bill, here, Altman transforms Duval into a literal cartoon. Olive's linear figure seems as impossible to replicate in real life as Popeye's massive arms. And the film doesn't use computer-generated effects to replicate her stretching or tangling limbs. But Duval manages to achieve these effects anyway with her physicality. She exaggerates her movements so beautifully, twisting her feet in knots when she doesn't know where to go, tripping over herself, sticking her chin up in a huff, arching into long lines as she dances. Critics and audiences saw exactly what Altman had seen. You were in Popeye. It was a picture that wasn't terribly well received by critics. Were you happy with your role as olive oil in Popeye? Oh, very much. I got good reviews. <laughs> Me and the baby. <laughs> <laughs> Shelley Duvall was fated to be the definitive olive oil. She was born to play Miss Oil. The New Yorker, which consistently gave Duvall some of the best reviews of her career, gave a tepid review to the film in general, but heaped praise on her. Duvall may be the closest we've ever come to a female Buster Keaton. Her eccentric grace is like his. It seems to come from the inside out. Shelley Duvall takes the funny page drawing of olive oil and breathes her own spirit into it. Possibly she can do this so simply because she accepts herself as a cartoon to start with. And working from that goes way past it. So far past it that we begin to find Chic, her soft, floppy white collars and her droopy, elongated skirts. Although Shelley Duvall arguably had one of the most visible years of her career in 1980, What's disappointing about much of the coverage that year 
is that it had not evolved at all in the decade she had been working as an actress. Articles from 1970 read virtually the same as they do in 1980 and even beyond. It's as if no one took her seriously enough to keep tabs on her or to develop a narrative about her beyond the same three talking points. So she was constantly in the position to reintroduce herself to audiences, retelling the story of her discovery over and over, that she'd only ever taken two acting lessons in her life, then there'd be a brief review of her performance, and inevitably, a description of her appearance. If anything, the thing that evolved the most was the tone of their descriptions. In 1970, there's a certain affection for her quirkiness, a thin, graceful girl with Betty Boop eyelashes, a long, lean wisp of a girl at once gangly and graceful. But by 1980, the tone reads much more blunt and judgmental. For example, she has, without exception, looked weird in all of her films. Never a beauty contest winner, and not likely to be, Duval is aware that she doesn't keep Bo Derek awake at night. Again, it really makes you think that Shelley Duvall was born a few decades too early because no way this woman wouldn't be the face of every major fashion brand in 2024. Now, the accepted narrative about Popeye is that it completely bombed and in doing so briefly ruined Altman's career. This isn't exactly true. Popeye actually did well at the box office, earning $49 million off of a budget of $20 million. So it definitely didn't bomb, it just wasn't the massive hit Paramount wanted. Context is useful here. It's worth pointing out that Three Women came out the same year as the first Star Wars film, Nashville the same year as Jaws. Even as Altman was making some of his best work, the industry was shifting under his feet. When I'm asked what the big difference is between the movies of the 1970s and those of the 80s, I say that in the 70s, the best directors were trying to make the great American film, and in the 80s, they were trying to make the great American hit. The career of one director in particular dramatizes that, and his name is Robert Altman. Post Popeye, in this new entertainment landscape that prioritized blockbusters, Altman found it more difficult than ever to secure funding for the films he wanted to make. So he returned to television and focused on directing stage adaptations. He and Duvall would never collaborate again. Why, though? There were certainly opportunities for them to do so. I could see her appearing and come back to the five and dime Jimmy Dean, Jimmy Dean. Plus, they always spoke affectionately about each other. It doesn't seem like there was a falling out or bad blood that prevented a reunion. For her part, Popeye marks a tonal shift in Duvall's work. It gave her a chance to be light and silly, which apparently appealed much more to her personal tastes. I guess I got my first taste of comedy in Three Women. And then Popeye you know, made me an addict. I love it now. And then the time band, it says, encouraged it even more. So well, I think I'm incorrigible now. Her next film, Time Bandits, with the Monty Python crew, let her develop that skill set as an actress. Then she took her career into her own hands and began creating that lighter, imaginative material for herself and produced fairy tale theater from 1982 to 1987. I should emphasize that fairy tale theater was a real achievement, demonstrating not only her creativity, but also her business acumen. A 1983 article in the New York Times detailed how most of the key creative decisions on fairy tale theater have been made by Miss Duval. She's chosen the stories, selected the cast and other creative participants, and has even determined the visual style to be adopted in each segment, basing each one on the work of a different painter or illustrator. Altman's contributions to Duval's acting career are obvious, but I also can't help but think that her skill as a producer was also honed being in his company. Watching small productions come to life, gathering talented collaborators, making tight budgets work, keeping a congenial atmosphere. So Duval was booked and busy, but what of Altman? Were there offers from him she didn't accept? Or did the offers not come through at all? It's not clear why exactly they never reunited, but certainly his position in the industry had changed, as did American society. If we return to the idea of Altman as someone who is consistently commenting on Americanness, and also the idea of her not collaborating with him again after Popeye, I'm wondering if there's something about Shelley Duvall 
that reads very specifically about the America of the 1970s and not about the 1980s, which would make him less inclined to work with her. That's a really good point. I mean, I feel like on some levels, absolutely. Like I think that, that, that she kind of, it's like the social zeitgeist of the seventies that she captures that. And, and particularly in three women, because all those monologues are about consumer culture, you know, magazines, beauty norms of the seventies. So it really is like this time capsule of the, of the 1970s and what it, it meant to live then, particularly for a young uh, unattached woman, like what that meant to go through that. Yes, she was defined not just by the new Hollywood, but she was defined by that era. And I think, you know, you get to the 80s, well, you know, you kind of move into Reaganite entertainment by the mid 80s and it's kind of all over. And I, but I do think there's something definitely about Duval capturing a certain kind of nonconformism, uh, a certain kind of a transgression that happened in the 1970s that still hasn't recurred. Duval acted throughout the 1990s in a lot of films and television shows for kids, work that allowed her quirkiness and affection for the fantastical to thrive. Oh, and of course, Jane Campion's portrait of a lady. But no one ever gave her a role as substantial as Millie again. It's not entirely clear why Duval left LA to return to Texas in the 90s. I've read everything from health reasons to family to an earthquake to all of the above. So there are a lot of missing pieces in her story. But at some point, Shelley Duvall stopped working and lost contact with the industry altogether. Eventually, journalists and fans tracked her down. And aside from one very annoying, unqualified, exploitative television psychologist, these encounters seem mostly respectful and joyful. It's been amazing to see Duvall's revival online over the past several years as a cult figure, fashion icon, as someone who a lot of people grew up loving and were excited to support. I don't think there was a mean bone in Shelley Duvall's body, and you could see that on screen. So much warmth radiates from her. Even if Altman didn't always use her in the most nuanced way, I'm still so grateful that A, he happened upon her that day in Houston, and B, that he had a way of working that allowed the best of Shelley to shine through. And one of the saddest things for me is like, I'm not going to be able to send her a copy of the book because she's passed recently. It's not like I'm trying to change the narrative on Duval, but I think what that what the book tries to do is really show her contributions and her strengths as an actress in the film and how, even though she was applauded for that performance, how it was underrated. And it's, I, I wanted her to know, I, I get it, and, I, and lots of other people get it too. Robert Altman certainly had his frustrations with the film industry, and I can't imagine what he'd make of streaming and the rise of blockbuster IP films. But there are platforms where innovative, subversive films still reign supreme, and Mubi is one of them. Mubi is a curated streaming service dedicated to elevating great cinema from all around the globe. From iconic directors to emerging auteurs, there's always something new to discover. With Mubi, each and every film is hand-selected by a wonderfully talented team of curators. You can discover the best of cinema at your fingertips, streaming anytime, anywhere. Here are three films streaming on Mubi that I think you should watch right now. If you like the psychological haunting aura of three women, try The Nest. This was one of my favorite films from 2020. Carrie Coon's stunning performance as an American housewife, frustrated by her new life in an English manner, anchors this eerie film about the stressors of marriage and the excess of 1980s lifestyles. If you like the layered chaos of Nashville, try The Death of Stalin. It was written and directed by the creator of Veep, so that should give you an idea of the type of humor it has, but aside from that, it's a wild portrait of bureaucrats battling for power in the days following the death of Stalin, spelling out the lengths individuals will go to to win the day. If you like the anti-Hollywood glamour portrayal of American life in Thieves Like Us, try Certain Women, with a cast that includes Laura Dern, Lily Gladstone, Kristen Stewart, and Michelle Williams, Kelly Reichardt's Certain Women is a tremendously acted anthology, weaving together three stories of women trying to forge their own paths in a small town in Montana. 
It has all of Reichardt's signature subtleties, exploring the failures to communicate, hidden desires, and harsh realities of everyday life. It's a slow burn, but one that I think will leave you thinking about it for a while after. Thankfully, you can check out all of these films right now for free on Mubi, of course. Because they're sponsoring this video, all you have to do is click the link in my description below and you're set. Just go to movie.com slash bekindrewind and you'll get a whole month free. Access a world of cinema right now with just one click. Get your month free at movie.com slash bekindrewind today.